And then do you want to do questions? Or? Yeah. You do? Okay. Yeah, we'll do a question and Q&A from the okay. audience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then... Uh, well, I okay. thought, like, we'll leave, like, 30 minutes, 20. Well, it might be less. You know, if there aren't going to be that many, if it ends up not being that many people, there's probably, I don't know if there'll be a lot of questions or not, but we can okay. do, like... Okay. You've started already? Yes. But okay. we're not... We're not dreaming at you guys, but they can hear. Yeah. So, okay. Where is it going to be? Is it on the CUNY, CUNY channel? It's on um, the central. Are you, are you telling us to cut the gossip? No, I'm just, <laughs> just, just thank you. you that's good. I'm that's joking. good to know. Thank so we're still just waiting for Virginia. She's in the building, but she's actually. Like, she, she's still just waiting for Virginia. She's in the building, but she's are we going to open the program? Here I wanted to say something to Cindy Ari. And he just... It's a good thing we weren't saying anything. Sure. <laughs> Bad about it. All right. All right. Okay. Um, but, uh, this is my assignment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh, you need a timekeeper. You're going to time us. You really have to be. Let me, let me get my I, I'm phone. terrible. I'm terrible. It's okay, I'll keep that. The last time I did this, I was reprimanded. Uh-oh. Okay. Uh-oh, Virginia. Yeah. I, a very important person whose only comment to me was so. you spoke for 18 I hope I don't get recommended for oh tonight. My God. <laughs> so we're doing what, like, approximately 10 minutes? 10 minutes, and if you take a minute over, it's okay. That's torturous, right? 10 minutes on, on the verbal No, I only have 10 minutes, so I'm fine. <laughs> so here's a I'm, I'm not good time. time. If you guys run over, I'm going to go like this. <laughs> okay. Okay, you have to assume that we're going to hear you. Okay. And 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 well, we, we, didn't, need to, we, we were talking about the order. Do you, do you want to go first, or does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So, I'm just going to talk about the newspaper, so I'm not doing a critical analysis. No, no, that's okay. okay. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll I'm going to introduce Vanessa, and then. Be here is a celebration of Julia de Burgos, of course, but also a celebration of the publication of um, Vanessa's uh, book uh, about Julia de Burgos. And uh, so welcome and, and thank you for being here. Thanks uh, to uh, the Centro, El Centro de Estudios Puerto Ricanos, for, for having us here. Uh, Edwin Melendez, thank you. And um, my name is Oscar Montero. Um, I was a professor at Lehman College and the Graduate Center here at CUNY. Um, Vanessa, uh, you, many of you know her, but she is a, I'll do a brief introduction, she's a professor at Brooklyn College, and she is the editor of Hispanic Caribbean Literature of Migration, Narratives of Displacement. Mm. She is the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, including the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, and the American Association of University Women grant. Today we celebrate the publication of Becoming Julia de Burgos, The Making of a Puerto Rican Icon. Um, and I uh, will give uh, the floor to Vanessa because she wanted to say uh, a few words. Yeah, before, before we get started, I just wanted to dedicate tonight to Juan Flores. Um, who a wonderful mentor and friend who we lost early, earlier this week. And I don't know if I can say too much more, but he, um, he was my, my Woodrow Wilson fellow mentor and hosted me at NYU for the year while I was writing the book. And um, he read every page gave me feedback, that was in 2010. And then from there, we just developed a wonderful friendship. And um, I know his spirit is here tonight mm -hmm. with us. So I, I will um, briefly introduce, we have um, two um, distinguished uh, panelists, and I will introduce them briefly and they will make uh, some comments about uh, Julia Burgos and about the book. The, our first speaker is uh, Professor Richard Perez. He is Associate Professor of English and Director of the U.S. Latino and Literature Minor in uh, John Jay College here at City University. And uh, Professor Perez has edited, uh, co-edited two critical anthologies, Contemporary U.S. Latino, Latina, Criticism and Moments of Magical Realism in U.S. Ethnic Literatures. Among his other publications, I will just mention a recent article titled The Debt of Memory, Reparations, Imagination, 
and history in Toni Morrison's Beloved. So, Professor Richard Perez. Thank you. Uh, first, um, I want to say what an honor it is and to be able to speak about uh, what I consider uh, an enormously important breakthrough in uh, Julia de Burgos' um, scholarship. Um, I want to thank the Centro for having me, for Vanessa Perez uh, for inviting me and giving me the kind of uh, leeway to wrestle with this wonderful text. Um, but before I talk about uh, the text and uh, just a kind of series of short reflections, um, I do want to say something about Juan Flores, who is um, a figure who played an important role, not only in my life, uh, but really kind of formed uh, the field and formed so many scholars of our generation. Um, and while I can't go into detail, I do want to express my condolences to his family, to our field, and to our community uh, for the loss of such a towering figure. Uh, indeed, one of my last uh, and very fond memories of Juan is sitting with him in a bar on 35th Street discussing Miguel Pinheiro in relation to Walt Whitman, exploring the ways in which Pinheiro's poetry effectively shifted our sense of American optimism uh, in Whitman. So it's, it, he, he was this kind of extraordinary figure who had this incredible range. Um, but tonight also marks a kind of celebration, right? So I want to kind of try to shift the affect of energy too uh, and to celebrate this extraordinary achievement um, by Vanessa. Uh, because what she does is she creates a hermeneutic shift in the way we approach Julia de Burgos. And this shift is not just in how we understand the life of Julia de Burgos. We know its details. Indeed, there is a way in which the very mention of Julia de Burgos incites the story of her life, a story that dominates, dominates our relation to her and to some extent overshadows the gift she gives to all of us, which is her poetry. This, I contend, sits at the heart of Vanessa Perez's significant contribution. For even as her text presents Burgos's life, gives historical context, and so on, it does, it, it does so to provide interpretive tools so we, first and foremost, learn how to read Burgos's poetry. And anyone who has immersed themselves in de Burgos's work knows there's a level of complexity we have to navigate. Because for de Burgos, complexity signals the imaginative attempt to unhinge and unhouse the reader, to jar us out of our given realities, and thus set, set off a process of transformation central to a liberatory existence. We know that liberation, not just in a simple political sense, as a decree or a declaration, <coughs> forms the ontological basis of her poetic, poetic project. How does reading free us? This is an extraordinarily important question, I think. And in a time where uh, being distracted has become kind of the mode of our existence, right? Um, since as de Burgo shows, there is an attention and concentration required for self and social transformation. This is to me the fundamental, fundamental contribution of, of becoming Julia de Burgos. It teaches us how to read this great poet's work and teaches us how to read Julia de Burgos is an ambitious task. Van Vanessa does this by mobilizing a series of tropes or metaphors that identify a process of delinking the subject, Julia de Burgos, and by extension, the reader, from certain uh, heteronormative patriarchal injunctions. She grounds her reader her reading of de Burgos by first naming her a nomadic subject without ties that bind or bound her into a predisposed life or identity or cultural positioning. And from this idea of a nomadic life and sensibility, Vanessa is able to generate a series of theoretical terms which she moves fluidly in and out of from feminism to sexile to transnational politics practices to literary legacies, to the question of remembrance, to the creating of contemporary modes of Latinidad. 
So you can see the rigorous breadth of her project that I'm talking about, Vanessa's. A breadth made necessary in large part by, the de Burgos, by de Burgos's own poetry. When you read de Burgos, it feels like you've jumped off the proverbial cliff because her poetry in an almost cosmic sense asks us to embrace not just one singularity or cultural place or historical moment, but what she likes to call infinity. For most poets, when you use a term like infinity, it sounds pretentious. And when you read it in de Burgos, you're blown away by the kind of uncanny revelation and, and potential um, in the way she uses it. Um, as her poetry is thinking about physics, as if her poetry is thinking about physics, about theories of relativity or dimensions of liberatory realities. She is Stephen Hawking before Stephen Hawking. And what is wonderful about Vanessa's readings is de Burgos, uh, of de Burgos is that each chapter expands, taking up another symbol or metaphor or dimension of de Burgos as if theoretically living up to de Burgos' cosmic challenges, unabashedly entering <laughs> into new hermeneutic terrains. I have to say, after reading Vanessa's book, I realized there's something terrifying about what de Burgos' poetry asks of us. A kind of utter commitment to transformation. Yet once you settle down, you realize that more horrifying still is to live without having read her. Because it seems to me that one of the things that Burgos' poetry does is, ch is change our relation to time itself. You see this in, Vanessa, in, in how Vanessa detail, uh, deals with, with de Burgos. She's unrelenting in her interpretive pursuit of, of de Burgos. She's nomadic, Vanessa tells us. She's a sexile. She lives in sexile. She's iconic. She's extra national. And this is all to say she's a symbol of becoming. What does she mean by becoming? Why does she choose to title her book in the future tense as if to suggest that de Burgos or some aspect of de Burgos has yet to come is still part of a horizon that we as a community, as a community of readers, have yet to reach? The reason de Burgos poetry is so utterly important is not because she speaks to us from the past, and this is, this is incredibly important to me as a reader of de Burgos, but I also glean this from the text, from Vanessa's text. It's not that she speaks to us from the past, but from the future. Her work addresses us from the future. This is why she is a poet and not a historian. As a poet, she reconfigures, reconfigures her relation to time in nomadic and sexilic terms. If the past in a historical sense informs the present, makes the present aware of who or what preceded it. It also, it also, and this is the danger de Burgos recognized in certain forms of historical discourse and tradition, imposes itself on the present, creates a toxic de debt from which the present cannot wrench itself. So the present, like Lot's wife in the Bible, turns to stone, stays trapped by a fetishized past that weighs it down, that enforces patriarchal tradition into a conformed now. This is why uh, Vanessa's book rightly begins analyzing the rigid male-centered nationalist movement in Puerto Rico in the 1930s, and why de Burgos turns to lyric poetry, because lyric poetry allows her to break, to use Vanessa's phrase, break with the past and thereby access a language of self and social transformation unavailable in traditional and sometimes historical forms of speech. For lyric poetry not only addresses a self, but a beyond, what de Burgos calls an unfettered moment, where she teaches us to die in order to live, so that the, po the poetic generates life beyond the life we are currently in, to allow parts of ourselves that no longer work to perish and affirm new potentialities, to access whatever is divine or cosmic or infinite in ourselves, to make us receptive to our futures. For in de Burgos' poetry, it is poetry that is uh, that what is what haunts us. Um, 
because it, it, it's it's kind of cites and encourages and and pushes us to what we should or may or could become. It is from this future, always already a feminist future, that de Burgos poetry speaks to us. Vanessa's title then identifies the genius of Julia de Burgos, since the poet's injunction to us is what we commit, is that we commit to a state of becoming. Edward Glissant, the great Caribbean philosopher uh, and a mentor of mine in the Graduate Center, used to say to me, Richard, I write for a reader in the future, as if to intimate that the readers of his work had not yet arrived. I think Vanessa's book suggests that these readers, that de Burgos and Glissant yearn for in, in, in her own life, have indeed arrived. And yet the poetic beyond de Burgos insisted on has made, thanks to Vanessa's efforts, been made ever more accessible. And as Vanessa's reading of de Burgos suggests, perhaps it is not just to reformulate Glissant's phrase that writers write from the future to a future audience, but that the future belongs to those who read. And that reading poetry endows us in the present with a gift, with an insight into what could come next, what, what we can reform, what is, what is before and beyond us revealing the capacity, as Vanessa puts it, to continually imagine new possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we have questions and comments, but we'll, we'll, if you don't mind, we'll hold off on that until, until the end, and uh, we'll come back to questions for Professor Perez. I uh, would like to... Uh, Introduce now uh, Virginia Sanchez Corral. Professor uh, Sanchez Corral is uh, professor of Puerto Rican studies at Brooklyn College. Her work is well known to many of us, and I'll just be uh, uh, brief and mentioning some of that work. She is the author of From Colonia to Community, the History of Puerto Ricans in New York, in New York City. Among her many publications, uh, I'll just cite one, for example, to give you an idea of, of her work, is In Search of Unconventional Women, Histories of Puerto Rican Women in Religious Vocations Before Mid-Century. And this is in a, in a collection titled Unequal Sisters, a Multicultural Reader in U.S. Women's History. She is also co-editor of the Puerto Rican Struggle Essays on Survival in the U.S. And Professor Sanchez Coro. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to join my condolences as well to the to the memory of uh, of Juan Flores, who was uh, a scholar, an activist, and a dear friend. Uh, his work will continue. His work has influenced everything that we have done in, in the field of Latino studies, Afro-Latino studies, Puerto Rican studies. And, uh, and I, could, uh, I could almost see his influence in the book. Uh, when Vanessa told me that he had read every page, I said, well, he's going to be there tonight. Uh, I have a few comments. Uh, I'm, I, I thank you, Richard, for giving such a beautiful um, analysis of the of the work that Julia de Burgos has has created, has left us. What is her legacy? I I think of her more and as as a person who was part of the Puerto Rican diaspora. I think of her as a New Yorican. In fact. And, and uh, the few comments that I have are just to place her uh, in that co within the context of the uh, Puerto Rican community during the 30s and the 40s, and, uh, and, and, and to tell you why I think that she was such a, a New Yorican, uh, a person very, very well known to us, uh, not the icon that is distant from us, 
uh, uh, whose, whose work will lead us to self-discovery. But, uh, but an, an everyday person who walks these streets just like we do today. And uh, that part of the book, to me, uh, was was uh, inspirational and 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 also it was a find because what I I thought was so many books written about this 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 poet have concentrated on her work on her tragic death and um, and uh, and her perhaps her 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 belief in independence for Puerto Rico. And then that's it. But Vanessa's book allows us to see the woman who writes to her sister, who lives in New York, who gets lost in New York, who travels the trains, who goes to, to Ellis Island, who goes to, to the important sites in the city, uh, who, who experiences the cold, who experiences the discrimination, who begins to understand what discrimination is. Uh, against minorities in in this this huge city, a topic that is so timely at this very moment, uh, uh, and she experienced it and is able then to bring it into her literature. That's something that a Puerto Rican writer living in Puerto Rico would not have been able to tell us. And so I'm struck by the fact that Julia de Burgos is a New Yorkian. And I, 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 I do not see this life as a tragedy. I see this life as, as something that we should celebrate because she tells us so much about ourselves. I was speaking to uh, uh, Dr. Edna Costa Belen, a professor colleague of ours uh, in Albany, and we happened to mention that we were going to be here tonight talking about the book. And uh, she said to me, uh, you know, when I was growing up in, in Puerto Rico, the only thing that I knew from my education through the public schools and the university was that she wrote Rio Grande de Luisa and, uh, and that she, she wrote other poems about nature and, uh, and, and, and uh, the, even the feminist poems where she talks about her two selves and, and trying to become the real Julia de Burgos. Those were not in the curriculum in the Puerto Rican school system. She says, and she was the first one to point out to me something that I had already been thinking was that Julia de Burgos is a New Yorican. Uh, I was, uh, uh, when I think of her living within our communities and I think of her uh, doing the things that we do, uh, I was also struck by the fact that when she's writing some of her most important essays, which I'd like to get to in a minute, um, I was a little girl growing up in the Bronx. You know, she's writing this big essay about D-Day and how the Second Front is happening and how the next invasion, the, the next part of the invasion is, is going to take place and uh, in Pueblos uh, Hispanos, and I was a little kid making little umbrellas and throwing them out the window to celebrate D-Day because that's what we were doing. I lived in the same world as she lived in. And uh, to me, that's very, very special. I look particularly at the area of Julia de Burgos living in New York among, uh, among the leading figures of the Puerto Rican community. And you mentioned, you know, you mentioned, uh, of, of course, Pura del Pre and Jesus Colón and uh, 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 Clemente Soto Vélez. Uh, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, who founded Pueblos Hispano. Este Consuelo La, uh, Lee uh, uh, Tapia, uh, 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 Antonio Corretjer, all of these people were revolutionaries. They were Puerto Rican revolutionaries. They were fighting for the independence of Puerto Rico, but not only Puerto Rico, but all of the all of the pueblos hispanos that were that were under dictatorship, including including uh, writing essays and uh, supporting anti-fascist forces uh, in Spain, they were very very they were ahead of their times, in the sense that they were dealing with issues that um, New York City as a whole was not even was not even aware of. Uh, if you compare newspapers like Pueblos Hispanos or Gráfico, which was a little bit earlier, or Artes y Letras, which was about 
uh, the same time as uh, Pueblos Hispanos, uh, you would see an emphasis on an international phenomenon, international focus. Uh, you would see uh, uh, a dedication to justice, uh, uh, alliance with the, with the working class, uh, support of the unions for the working class. This was the vibrancy that was New York City for the Latino community, and this is where she found a home, the home that she did not find mm -hmm. in Puerto Rico, and she did not find in Cuba, but she found it in New York. Mm -hmm. Because in New York, she could begin to be the person that she was, uh, independentista, uh, feminist, uh, a supporter of, 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 of causes, particularly the, 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 the political causes. Um, uh, a person who saw Puerto Rico as uh, the Puerto Ricans from here and the Puerto Ricans on the island as a nation divided by U.S. and U.S. economic structure. I mean, she's, she's, mm. she's writing these things before anyone else is really doing this type of analysis. And, uh, and that, to me, was, uh, was striking. And it was a revelation. And it was what begins to make her a real person. Uh, one of the things that I liked very, very much, well, let me tell you something first about Pueblos Hispano. Uh, that was a, a newspaper. Uh, it came out every week, five cents. There's a beautiful illustration in the book of, of, the, of, of the newspaper. It had, um, uh, it stated its reasons for being, uh, and among the reasons was to unify the colonias hispanas in the United States uh, to defeat uh, Nazi, uh, Nazi uh, fascism, to defend the rights of Hispanic minorities in the United States, to, uh, to seek the immediate independence of the nation of Puerto Rico that, that's, that was the wording, of the nation of Puerto Rico, uh, to combat prejudice. Uh, and prejudice was defined as uh, discrimination based on race, uh, color, uh, creed. They weren't dealing so much with feminism yet, so you have to be a little <laughs> bit patient with that. Uh, nor were they dealing with uh, sexual orientation, but you know, that eventually would happen. Uh, to struggle against Franco, to liberate all the political prisoners of the world. Uh, that one struck me as one of the one of one of their one of the agendas because um, I never heard anyone talking about liberating all of the political prisoners. Think about it in the world. That 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 is that that is that's a hard one to take. Mm. I could see liberating some perhaps not others, but they're saying that their agenda is to liberate all of the political prisoners en el mundo, en el mundo, uh, to better the relationships of, uh, in the Americas through the diffusion of culturas hispanas. Uh, so many 